John Fedger with mobilehomeinvesting.net. Thank you so much for watching this video. Uh, this video is going to be a QA. and I don't usually do question and answer videos like this because I typically answer questions kind of as I get them. But with the podcast, if you've been watching the Mobile Home Investing Lessons podcast, thank you if you have. Uh, if you haven't, please check them out. We're doing kind of video podcasts now. Well, I usually try to answer the questions that come in there on the podcast. Well, a few have come in over time that we didn't get to answer. So I want to answer some of those now. These are questions that you may have had. There are some are state specific, some are country specific. Maybe you didn't even know to ask these questions, but we're going to talk about them here. I am going to email the people who asked me these um, and answer them more in depth. On this video, I want to briefly talk about all of the answers. And then if you have any follow up questions, the person listening to my voice right now, please feel free to email me. Questions are amazing. You should, you should ask questions, you should get answers, and then that answer should lead to five more questions that will only make you a more su uh, sufficient. Uh, mobile home investor, real estate investor. So um, with that said, let's go ahead and get into this. Oh, you can email me at support at mobilehomeinvesting.net, uh, support at mobilehomeinvesting.net. The first question is from William, fr William from Maricopa County, Arizona. He asks, why do you oppose buying mobile homes in 55 plus parks? I'm cautious about that. And, and if, if you're getting started in mobile home investing, I would encourage you to begin with senior com uh, with family communities. The reason I'm a little hesitant with regards to senior communities is that senior communities, obviously, when you're selling the homes, they can restrict who you're selling to. They lower, they limit the selling demographic. We can only sell to senior citizens. Senior citizens also are different buyers than family buyers, or different sellers than family type sellers. So you just have to be aware of the dif the differences there. But also the demand. If you can verify that there's demand in your local area from senior buyers either willing to pay you cash, go through bank financing, seller financing. If you can verify that, then by all means, there might be a way for you to create value in your local area with senior type of sellers and, and, and buyers. But I do would you want you to be cautious, but definitely areas around the country, I and mean, you're in Arizona, um, a, a Arizona, New Mexico, parts of California, Florida, all sort of senior citizen snowbird mecca type areas. Uh, so you can definitely create value there. Now on the other side, there's a lot of folks trying to sell their homes. Uh, and then again, it's, it's a supply and demand type of type of issue. Now, depending on your exit strategy, again, if you're selling with, with some payments that can open up who you're selling to. Uh, but just with seniors, be cautious. If you have any specific questions or examples, feel free to contact me, William. Uh, Jed from Midcoast, Maine is wondering about bandit signs and mass mailings. Bandit signs are great. Uh, around you know mobile home dense areas uh, and even areas that aren't mobile home dense we're never sure quite you know who's going to see it um, and then your bandit signs depending on what they say we buy homes we buy mobile homes mass mailings are good too mass mailings just general to a whole mobile home subdivision or more targeted out-of-state owners um, absentee owners uh, uh, expired MLS listing, code violations, delinquent taxes, etc. Uh, so I'm a fan of, of all of that. Now, consistent on both. Don't just do one or two. Consistent, you know, get your name out there. There's not many of us doing this. So, um, I, yeah, thumbs up on both of those. Uh, John from Las Vegas, Nevada. How much interest do you charge on financing to the buyer? Uh, whenever I'm selling a home via owner financing, uh, under usury, I mean, 15% or less, uh, sometimes 0% interest. Um, but that all has to be, I would encourage you to use a mortgage loan originator uh, to be safe uh, and then get some advice as well with that um, mortgage loan originator. When you are buying a home from a seller, I typically almost never pay any sort of interest. And the reason I explain this is because that's just the terms of the sale whenever we are uh, buying a home from a from a seller, you know, they're not lending us any money. We're simply purchasing the home from them, and the conditions or the the, the terms of the sale are X amount of payments. If after I pay off the home to the seller, then they want to lend me money, then we'll talk about an interest rate. But if I'm just buying the home from them with seller financing, uh, I rarely pay an interest rate. Um, and if you have any specific questions about that, reach out to me. Larry from Sacramento, California, the best place to get started. Larry, you're in a specific, uh, a unique area of the country. So go ahead and watch a video uh, that I did previously on investing in areas that are uh, very pricey, um, basically kind of in your area you know, of California, the coastal areas around the country. Um, John from Northeast Ohio asks, are mobile home repairs unique? The homes I have been in over the years are built out of press board walls, uh, et cetera. How different to repairing floors, electrical, windows, et cetera? Um, don't mobile homes depreciate? So a couple different questions here. Mobile homes are unique. Throughout the years, they've been built differently. Back in June 1976, 
Uh, HUD stepped in and said, you know what, from now on, we're, we're saying at least you have to meet these requirements uh, for your mobile home. They can still use press board, but you, know, you have to meet this national standard. Some companies went overboard. There were, I don't actually know, you know, near 100, give or take, different companies building mobile homes at the time. And then once HUD stepped in, a number of those companies went away. They couldn't make as much money. Um, and then you know we're left now with the number of home builders that we have. Amazing uh, types of mobile homes that they build now. Actually, if you want to go to a video of a previous walkthrough of a mobile home factory, it was really awesome to see the brand new mobile homes being built. Um, so they're all different. Uh, interesting fact, the reason why they stepped in, HUD stepped in the middle of 1976 is because kind of like cars, mobile homes have models, you know, 2016 model, 2017 model, and those models go from about June to June. So that's why the middle of the year is when HUD kind of stepped in and said from now on, nationwide standards. Uh, what you see is what you get with a mobile home. I do a video where we walk through a mobile home and basically there is only a few layers to a mobile home. So as long as you're willing to kind of peel things back, explore, know what you're getting into, um, it's kind of just remove and replace um, what, what needs to be done. Uh, you know, electrical, plumbing, get a professional. Uh, don't mobile homes depreciate? Yes, I do another video. Um, about that, uh, about mobile homes depreciating uh, and what that means to you. So go ahead and check that out. Sandra from South Attleboro, Massachusetts. Uh, hi there. I'm wondering if you sell your mobile home to an investor. Are there any drawbacks to this? Um, I paid $74,000 11 years ago. It could certainly use uh, some TLC. She put on a new roof. Uh, but I guess what I'm asking is uh, if do they offer much lower price uh, if I tried to sell versus a real estate agent? Sandra, great question. Thank you for tuning in and watching. Yes, yes and no. So a couple different things here, and for investors, please you know listen because this is how I typically explain things to sellers that ask this question. Um, within you're you're going to sell if you sell your mobile home for the highest and best use. That is to someone that wants to live there and grow old and raise their family. So if you sell to that type of person, someone that is gonna live there, you're gonna make the most amount of money. They're gonna pay the most for that mobile home uh, and land for $74,000. Or maybe it's just the mobile home, I'm not sure. Uh, in South or Edelburgh, Massachusetts, it's probably just the mobile home for, for $74,000. So if you sell to an end buyer, they're going to pay the most. If you sell to an investor who's going to buy it much quicker, now there's a couple different ways that we can purchase. There is, and there's a couple diff different factors that go into a deal, um, Sandra. There's the price of the mobile home and then there's the terms. You can choose whichever one you want. Whichever one's most important to you, you can pick the price of the terms. You can choose first. And whichever one you don't want, I will choose the other. So if you choose price, you want $74,000, I'll tell you how I can give it to you. But it's going to be payments or a balloon or you know, something over time where I can also profit from the deal, um, depending on you know, what I can sell the home for and if this comes with land, etc. And then if you choose terms, you, know, you want cash, well, then I can tell you how much cash I can give you. So that's, I hope that that really made sense. Um, you know, be cautious with it with a real estate agent. Choose one that has experience that can give you referrals of you know acting quick and uh, you know selling a mobile home pretty quickly. Know what they're doing because uh, a lot of real estate agents are talk. Um, I know none of the folks listening to this channel are. You know, we are active um, and we do what we say we are. But I uh, hope that made sense, Sandra. If you have any specific questions, feel free to reach out to me personally. Um, Gerald Ray from Tucson, Arizona asks, "What is your opinion about the real estate market in Tucson? I think it's a big thumbs up." Um, I have already found out that some parks are very resistant to outside investors. What does outside investors mean? I mean, kind of new people to the park, maybe? Like you haven't established a relationship yet, maybe? Uh, and make it difficult to not respond to their contact request. If park managers aren't calling you back, that's kind of across the board. I don't know where park managers go, but during the day, if they say they're going to be there or the sign is open, the door's probably locked. They're out driving around somewhere or at the park attending to things. If you call them on the phone, you have to say certain things to kind of be a priority with regards to how to you know, uh, introduce yourself to park managers. Um, in fact, I did a video of that. Uh, you can click over there. Um, and then stay persistent. If they don't, you know, if they don't trust you yet, then they just haven't seen you enough. They have a valid reason. Maybe they don't want you removing homes from the park. You know, if it's a valid reason that you can overcome, so be it. If they're just being rude to you or they don't want the competition or they're being racist or bipolar or just a number of weird things, you don't get a good vibe for them, move on. There's plenty of other parks. But I can tell you from first-hand experience, second-hand experience, the mobile home market is in Arizona is very, very, very profitable, very uh, you can create value there for sure. 
Uh, Don from Seattle, Washington, can you put a second shingle roof over the first? The technical answer is yes, you can. You can kind of keep going with that. Most areas, though, only limit it to two layers, or some don't even say you have to don't even want two layers. They say you got to take off the first shingle roof to put on the second one. Uh, you most likely will have to pull permits for this. And um, the weight as well, something to consider, Don, especially in your area, um, if you get, I don't know how much snow you actually get in Seattle, but uh, you know that adds weight as well. Uh, on that mobile home walkthrough video where we go through the factory, um, we look at the mobile home trusses and we actually talk about the snow, the snow loads. Um, and what a mobile home can, can take. So second shingle roof, usually that's fine. I would check with your local code uh, department and ask them, but I hope that made sense. If you have any questions, reach out to me. <laughs> Next question. All right, a woman from North Carolina asks, um, I signed a title to a tenant uh, who made an arrangement to rent to own my mobile home, but I'm going to have to take them to court to get them to move the mobile home off of my land because that's the only thing I sold to them was the mobile home. They stated that they're going to put the mobile home into someone else's name. Uh, my question is, will I have to obtain a mobile home title to prove I own it in court because I did not get a bill of sale and do not know whose name the mobile home title has been titled into? In this case, you're in a great position. Now, obviously, these tenants who, I hope that they finished paying you off for the home. Uh, if they didn't, then you'll want to take the home back anyway. But as the landowner, you can go ahead and file for an abandoned title if they've completely been MIA and you don't know where they are, or you can go ahead and put a lien on the mobile home uh, and then repossess it. So as the landowner, you are kind of holding all of the cards. Now, whether you just want them to move this home off of the land or you really want to um, try to take the home back to then resell it, either way, you, you have that um, choice. You know, they may move the home off of the land if they already titled it into their own name and they see that now you're serious. Um, so I hope that that makes sense. Please, uh, if this changed at all, please go ahead and email me further. Uh, if you have any questions, follow-up questions or concerns, uh, again, you can reach me at support at mobilehomeinvesting.net. Eugene from Port St. Lucie, Florida asks, how do I get into parks uh, that say you cannot buy a home, remodel it, sell it, and rent it? Well, if all the parks are saying that, then it might be something that you're doing incorrectly. Uh, however, if you just run into that occasionally, once out of every 20 times, then go ahead and just pass it. Some parks just don't want to work with you or they look you up and down and they decide that you know they don't want to work with you for some reason or your competition uh, or they feel or there's some other objection that might be overcome so it is important to find out why they don't want you there and then try to overcome that maybe just think they th they think that you're trying to rent it because most parks don't want you to rent homes uh, so if you're trying just to sell it that may be different so try to work with the park to find out how you can work there Eugene um, you know instead of just doing kind of what you initially had planned Kevin from Massachusetts and New Hampshire. Last question, we did it. Uh, I'd like to see a quick video. I hope this counts as a quick video, <laughs> Kevin. Uh, getting the wind or snow load info on a mobile home. Uh, that is easy. You can go to the mobile home's data plate, which is uh, looks like this. And you can find it usually in the pantry area, in the master bedroom area, the hot water uh, uh, tank area, um, the electrical box area. Um, the washer and dryer area. It's going to be a piece of paper or a metal plaque on the wall with all the pertinent details about the mobile home when it was built, the manufacturer, the make, model, VIN number, etc. And also the wind load, the snow load information, um, if it's in a northern state where it would have snow load, but usually the wind is always in there, what, what rating it is. Uh, if you don't know that, but you do know the VIN number, the serial number of your mobile home, you can go to uh, my cheat sheet here is ibts.org. I'll put the link down in the description. You can go there and they, for a fee, if you provide them with the beer VIN number or serial number, they will give you the information, uh, more information on your mobile home, you know, as your data plate would, get, would give you. So as long as you have that VIN or serial number, they should be able to help out. Uh, mobile homes newer than 1976. So I hope that that, hope your home's newer than that. Um, hope, uh, oh, I'm sorry, number two, how to spot T111 and should this be an automatic deal breaker? T111 looks like this, and no, my first property was uh, had T111 all over it. I didn't know what it was at the time. It's a little bit more prone to rotting uh, than aluminum siding, than vinyl siding, but no, that is not a deal breaker at all. I mean, even if you had to replace all of it, you could add uh, vinyl siding, which would make it look 10 or 20 years newer from the outside, um, 
And no, no, that's, that's not a deal breaker at all. So if you have any more specific questions, let me know. Uh, and then number three, how to find non-nightmare deal, non deals uh, in my area where the vast majority of homes are over $50,000 in the Northeast. So in the Northeast, uh, there are opportunities there, and I am working with folks scattered through uh, Connecticut and New York and New Jersey, uh, New Hampshire, New England, Massachusetts, and there's opportunities out there for sure, and I will agree with you that there are a lot of mobile homes that are sold for $50,000, even in parks, 10000 20 30 40 50 uh, and there are cash buyers willing to pay that amount. Now, I will say that that's, the, that's a fact as well. So when you get into the nicer homes, you can resell them and your exit strategy can be a cash sale or bank finance sale. However, getting into those lower priced mobile homes under $10,000, those still absolutely exist and you have to make yourself well known. I'm not sure if people know who you are, Kevin, or they don't, but they need to know who you are. And it's not your fault that they don't or their fault, but you know that has to change. So parks need to know who you are, sellers need to know who you are, mobile home owners need to know who you are. Um, and there are owners that um, they pop up. It's a conveyor belt of people that get into situations where they need help from an investor. They need the speed of an investor and the um, ability for mobile home investors to think creatively to help them out of their sticky situation. Um, and that's a conveyor belt of people. So there is somebody taking advantage of those opportunities and capitalizing on those and helping those sellers. Um, now obviously that's not you, but you need to put yourself in those positions. So if you have any questions that's kind of into advertising and marketing and getting your name out there and becoming well known and making offers and following up and all of that stuff. I mean, this video is, I'm hoping, under 30 minutes right now. So thank you so much for watching. If you have any follow-up questions or concerns or the people watching or you watching right now, please uh, email uh, support at mobilehomeinvesting.net. And if you like this video, please uh, thumbs up it, please subscribe, please share it uh, with your friends uh, so they can like it and subscribe as well. Uh, isn't this cool? I'm in a cool office um, and I hope to maybe do some more of these uh, in this type of office. So I hope these questions and answers were valuable. Uh, if you have any follow-up, please comment them below and I'll talk to you soon. Again, you can reach me at support at mobilehomeinvesting.net. Bye-bye.